charge in Iraq. In addition to providing security, the military has trained and equipped Iraq's security forces and has overseen billions of dollars of reconstruction projects. The military has also provided vital support to the other U.S. agencies operating in Iraq, food, housing, transportation, and medical evacuation. Services have all been managed or carried out by the Defense Department. All that is about to change under President Bush. Agreements with the government of Iraq, U.S. military forces are to complete their exit from Iraq by December 31, uh, 2011. As a result, we have reached a new phase in Iraq, a phase that places less reliance on our troops and more on our civilian agencies. This new phase has been called Operation New Dawn, but from where I am sitting, it should have been called Operation New Challenges. As we reduce the number of troops in Iraq, many duties now performed by the military will be transferred to the State Department. The size and complexity of State's new role in Iraq is unprecedented. Numerous important issues appear to be unresolved. The State Department will take, more, take over many functions that are inherently military for which State has little or no expertise. This raises important practical questions. Who will provide security for State Department employees? Who will recover? personnel who are wounded or killed, who will provide convoy security, who will provide counter-fire and rocket art artillery and other mortar attacks, who will recover damaged vehicles and downed aircraft, who will provide explosives disposal. Even basic questions of what military equipment will be transferred to the State Department and who will apply rules for the use of force have still not been settled. Without the State Department having the expertise of the staff to carry out these functions, State will be forced to turn to contractors to fill this gap. For example, the Wartime Contracting Commission estimates that State will need more than double the number of security contractors it currently has in Iraq to as many as 7,000. The State Department must also grapple with how it intends to provide basic life support services. Despite poor past performance by KBR, the Army recently made the highly controversial decision to extend KBR's sole source contract under log cap 3 instead of competing in, 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 under log cap 4. The implications of this Army decision are unclear. With the huge increase in the number of contractors and contracting costs, the State Department will need to closely monitor these contracts. Unfortunately, providing effective contract oversight has not been the State Department's strongest suit. The State Department Inspector General, the Special Inspector General of Iraq Reconstruction and GAO have all found significant weaknesses in the State Department's contract management in Iraq. Even the State Department's Assistant Secretary of Management has acknowledged a lack of contract experience and expertise within the agency. Six months ago, Ambassador Patrick Kennedy wrote to the Defense Department outlining these issues and requesting help. Defense has still not fully responded. This apparent lack of cooperation is unacceptable. These issues cannot be ignored. We cannot sit on the sidelines and hope these problems take care of themselves. The risks are too high to botch the transition, and we cannot turn a blind eye to reckless contractors. We cannot afford to lose the gains our servicemen and women have fought so hard for over these years. I look forward to hearing testimony from the Commission on wartime contracting as well as the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. 
Both the Commission and the IG have completed important work in these areas and continue to be an important asset to the Congress. At this point, I would like to yield five minutes to the ranking member of the committee and say to him that these digs over here, just temporarily, we will be moving back to our regular quarters after the completion. Mr. Chairman, on so many things we find common ground, we find the ability to come together and to agree. Today's hearing is an example, leaving these digs is not. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, today's hearing is important and it is bipartisan. Now, we use the word bipartisan, nonpartisan, all these other things pretty often around here. It is pretty clear that the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, although supportive of the troops, have not always been equally supported on both sides. But as we are nearly two years into a new administration and America's vital national interests have fully transitioned from one President and one administration to another, and persistent problems remain. As the, war, the Commission on Wartime Contracting issues its report, the Special IG's reports have been keenly looked at by this committee, it is pretty clear that seven, eight years of one President in war and two years of another President in war look a lot the same. We are going to hear today about a number of needs in the transition. These are not new needs. Certainly, this committee has staked out a great deal of jurisdiction over the question of outsourcing of inherently governmental activities. In fact, no committee owns more of the responsibility to get it right in the future than this. The Diplomatic Security Service is woefully understaffed. Now, nine years ago, when that was the case, nobody was surprised. First one and then another war in which diplomats in great numbers were deployed while we were still at war and or in an occupation, created a unique need. So we never intended our diplomatic services to need attack helicopters, overhead eye in the sky, predator drones, and the like, but they did. Now, nearly a decade later, and two Presidents into two wars, we realize that there is an ongoing elevated need for a level of security to be provided for our diplomats that is not appropriate to, de to uh, provide by uniform services. It is not that the U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force haven't done a great job. They have. But they are not, in fact, the appropriate people to stand by a diplomat as he goes in saying, this is about peace. Our Marines, and I represent Camp Pendleton, have four virtually our entire time as a country guarded embassies. But as the diplomats go out, they need to go out in civilian clothes with the, to the greatest extent possible, a peacetime look. This is not currently possible through government employees. And the contracting system has been controversial. One, because it costs a great deal to employ somebody in these areas. And because it has been viewed as temporary and, as a result, the, the high cost and the lack of a systematic approach for what their rules of engagement will be have caused us diplomatic problems time and time again. This committee has held hearings on many of those diplomatic problems. Although this committee often looks at waste, fraud and abuse through the eyes of dollars and the projected cost and overruns that we will discuss today are huge and need to be addressed. I think this committee has an obligation to bring light today on the fact that after seven years in Iraq and a declared mission accomplished twice, we have to make sure that the, pow the powers that remain remain with the assets they need and appropriately, when inherently governmental, use governmental assets. Over the years, I have met with contractors who provide security services. Of course, they do it for compensation. But time and time again, they have said, this is not our company's core requirement. This is not what we do. These companies very rightfully would give that up in a transition, and that transition is long overdue. So as we talk to two panels of learned experts, I hope that we will focus on what we don't have today but should have had 
several years ago, a transition that in many cases has not really begun, and how we go forward from here on a bipartisan basis. Mr. Chairman, I know we can do this together. I know that the cost overruns and the sins of the past are just that, but we now have it on our watch, and I look forward to working together on this. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for his uh, statement. Um, I look forward to working with him. At this time, I would like to uh, ask the witnesses to please stand and raise your right hand. We swear all of our witnesses in. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the whole truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that both witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Michael Thibault is a co-chair of the Commission on Wartime Contracting. Before being appointed to the Commission, Mr. Thibault spent his career in public service at the Defense Contracting Audit Agency. From 1994 until his retirement from DCAA, Mr. Thibault served as the Deputy Director for the agency. Mr. Thibault is also a decorated Vietnam veteran serving in the United States Army from 1965 to 1968. We welcome you this morning. And Mr. Grant Green is a, one of the six commissioners who serves with the two chairs on the Commission on Wartime Contracting. Highlights from Mr. Green's career include appointment as Under Secretary of State for Management and Assistant Secretary of Defense. Mr. Green also spent 22 years in the United States Army and is currently the chairman of a business consulting firm. Welcome you. At uh, this time, I ask the witnesses to deliver their five minutes testimony. I understand that you, Mr. Thibault, will be delivering testimony on behalf of the Commission. And let me just say that um, even in our new digs, I understand that uh, you start out, the light is on green, and then we all of a sudden it moves to yellow, which, which coarsens, which means that you have one minute to summarize from that point. And as everywhere in the United States of America, red means stop. And of course, uh, when the red light comes on, that means stop. And of course, which will allow us an opportunity to raise questions with you. Let me thank both of you for being here this morning. And of course, uh, at this time, Mr. Thibault, you have five minutes to give your testimony. Thank you, uh, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and other members of the committee. I am Michael Thibault, co-chair of the Commission on Wartime Contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Beside me is Commissioner Grant Green. Thank you for inviting us to testify today. I will briefly summarize our joint statement and request the full statement be entered into the record. Without for objection, so ordered. Thank you. First, uh, I would like to, to state that uh, my co-chair, Chris Shays, who uh, has worked with me extensively as well as with this committee in his past, uh, very graciously asked Commissioner Green, because of the background that you recognized, um, that, uh, that, that he sit in uh, and, and provide testimony. Uh, I'm not sure I could have done that, but uh, he did, and, and uh, Commissioner Shays, as you mentioned, bipartisan, um, absolutely uh, in sync with uh, our efforts today. We were looking forward to seeing him because he served on this committee for a number of years. So we, I'm happy to know that he didn't feel it was a conflict of interest. <laughs> well, we had a few questions for him from his time here that we are still hoping to ask. Thank you. And we wanted to show him our new digs. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the future of the new Iraq is unsettled. This past Sunday, as the Washington Post reported, six car bombings in Baghdad and a suicide bombing in Fallujah killed 37 people and wounded more than 100. Iraq remains a dangerous place. The combination of a military withdrawal, a persistent security threat, and a return to customary intragovernmental relations brings us to our concerns for this hearing. The U.S. Embassy will remain after U.S. troops withdraw from Iraq. These circumstances combine to create what may be a unique situation in American history, a diplomatic presence reestablished and expanding in a country that appears unable to provide normal host country security and services while the U.S. military withdraws. 
The scheduled withdrawal of the U.S. military force, forces leaves State very little time to arrange for the alternative provision of functions. One example best highlights the many challenges facing the State Department. When insurgents attack United States bases, they often include rocket and other indirect fire as part of that attack. Presently, the U.S. Army has a sophisticated and highly effective system to provide immediate warning for these rocket attacks. This system is called the counter-rocket and mortar system. Within seconds of an enemy rocket or mortar launch, there is a warning for all base occupants. This system has saved countless lives. Also included is a counter-battery system where military indirect fire experts locate and return fire onto enemy insurgents. This counter-battery effort takes six to eight seconds and is critical. As a result, enemy insurgents seldom fire more than one rocket as they know they will be targeted. The State Department recently received an unsolicited contractor proposal and, how, and now has identified a commercial variant to replace the current system. They are presently evaluating how this system can be acquired. Even more troubling in this example, State Department executives informed us this week that the counter-battery effort will be terminated. Enemy insurgents will be delighted when they learn and experience that they will not be immediately targeted and brought under fire by the military. Where our enemies worked very hard to launch a single rocket, there will be little reason to not launch entire batteries of rockets. There will be no military consequences for them. Commission concerns were recently validated by our June 21, 2010 Capitol Hill by a June 21, 2010 Capitol Hill hearing. Among the troubling testimony we heard that day was what you've previously mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. The Department of State estimates that without U.S. military support, it will need to raise its private security force from 2,700 to almost 7,000. Under Secretary of State Patrick Kennedy wrote to the Department of Defense almost six months ago to request a substantial amount of military information plus continued access to the Army's log cap logistics contract and continued food and fuel supply through the Defense Logistics Agency. And we found that DOD's joint staff at that time had not forwarded uh, that request with a recommendation to the Office of the Secretary. <coughs> We've been informed informally that <coughs> that, excuse me, that they, they have. Uh, but we attempted to reach confirmation on that and we were unable. In summary, State Department program leaders have been dealt a hand that includes unknown contract and program support from the Department of Defense, funding limitations likely to impact their mission capability, and the need to contract for and perform functions that have never been done by their department. We believe that the State Department has been placed in an unfair position as they work to deliver on critical mission requirements in the continuing effort to stabilize and reconstruct Iraq. Uh, that includes our joint statement, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Issa. We thank the committee for its attention and welcome your questions. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. And um, uh, we will now start the questioning period. Um, each memo, of course, will have five minutes, and uh, I will begin. Your July report highlights very significant problems with transition planning for the Defense Department handoff to the State Department. Are we facing a potential disaster at this point? I, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not sure if I would refer to it as a potential disaster. We certainly are facing the potential for significant contract cost overruns, inefficiencies, and potential fraud, waste, and abuse if this transition occurs in, a, in the form of what might be called a pickup game. What do we need to do to fix this problem? Well, in, in our statement, um, senior executive leadership needs to uh, uh, address this at the, you know, our recommendation is at the secretarial level. Uh, there has been some coordination in theater now as a result of, uh, of our concerns and concerns raised by others, but it's at the uh, middle management level. There, there needs to be 
Uh, this needs to be pushed up uh, uh, to the highest levels within state and defense because it is that important. Right. Your report lists 14 security-related tasks currently performed by DOD that will soon be transferred to state, functions such as recovering killed and wounded soldiers will become a State Department responsibility. Who will be performing these functions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, some, uh, some of those 14 functions will probably fall off the table. They will, they will, not, it will not be necessary to do them, but the majority of them will. And uh, in most cases, uh, there will be contractors uh, performing those functions. Uh, there is a lot of coordination currently being done now uh, between State Department and the Defense Department on what uh, equipment can be left behind, for example, medical support. There is a dialogue ongoing now to see what medical support could be left behind by DOD uh, to support the State Department. Um, but some of these missions, uh, for example, uh, route clearance, which uh, had heretofore been done by the Department of Defense, will, will fall principally to either contractors or, and they plan on using uh, uh, UAVs to, to perform that mission. Um, the, the, the main question and, and the answer is that these functions will essentially be done by contractors. And uh, I think that that obviously uh, creates difficulties. You mentioned them in, in your uh, opening remarks, uh, inherently governmental functions. Uh, there is great concern uh, here in this body and uh, acro across America in, in some cases about personal security contractors. Uh, but we forget about all these other things that are military or quasi-military that will now be done by contractors. Um, one of the most extreme examples that I can think of is um, the State Department has asked for MRAPs. Uh, the Defense Department has at least verbally indicated they will provide those vehicles. They will be driven by contractors. And if there are occasions when they go into high threat areas uh, and they have weapons mounted, those weapons will, as it stands right now, uh, be manned by contractors. What I, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking about all these um, uh, uh, security contractors. You know, um, what are the fa what are the problems that we face in, in terms of the department face managing all of these security contracts? I mean, it seems to me that you're going to probably double or even maybe even triple the amount that's in there now. Right, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the management of security contractors for the Department of Defense and the Department of State has been a challenge. There have been uh, numerous instances that we have reported where they are not providing the kinds of quality and background investigation uh, that many of the security uh, officials uh, or, or, or contractors should, should have. Uh, in the case of State Department, they are going to be challenged with tripling, potentially tripling the size of their security force. Um, it is it, unprecedented. They acknowledge it is unprecedented. Uh, the other item I think that is important that Commissioner Green brought up is many of these inherently governmental items that are being transitioned to state from the military represent items where this Commission feels that the United States military is the superior performer, and many of them relate to security. And uh, with no disrespect for contractors, those items that are inherently governmental where professional military best performs it. Uh, should and could remain with the military. Let me be very basic. What can we do to make this transition work? Um, I, I think two things um, come to mind, uh, and that is the increased, expanded, and continuing dialogue and coordination between the State Department and the Defense Department. As uh, Chairman Thibault mentioned in his opening remarks, there has been 
um, a dialogue. It has mostly been at the middle management level. It is cer they have certainly progressed from the time that I was in country the end of May and spent a week with the State Department talking about the transition. Uh, U.S. Forces Iraq has been very forthcoming in providing liaison people and advisors to the embassy. Uh, but that has got to continue. Where I see a, a void is, and I go back to my time in the State Department when I was responsible for, on the State side for the transition from the uh, Coalition Provisional Authority, Ambassador Bremer, to the new embassy. And we had, I had a counterpart from the Defense Department, a retired Army Lieutenant General that worked directly for the Secretary. He was that belly button. And he came over there with a gaggle of colonels and helped us through that process. That process was nothing compared to what we are facing today. And what, where I see a hole is that we don't have, or I don't know of a person, we don't have a senior person, single person, from the Defense Department that can run interference and make things happen. Uh, we mentioned the log cap contract and the request for equipment and, and support for log cap DLA that went to the State Department, I mean, went to the Defense Department in April. As far as we know, it's still sitting there. We need somebody that can walk into the deputy's office or even the secretary's office and say, sir, we got to move this. We have to make a decision. If it's yes, great. If it's no, let's make a decision. Because much of the planning that state has to do today in country cannot be done until they know the status of log cap, as an example. Okay. And, uh, Mr. Law. Chairman, one simple add on to that is anything that this committee can do to compel the Department of Defense to provide support to the Department of State where it is needed and where they have that kind of expertise and can um, influence the criteria for providing that support uh, is needed. Uh, I only answered part of your question because you said, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, what, what else can we do? Right. I, I think the other key element here is a stable and reliable funding stream to state. I, c I can tell you for my four years there, uh, budget is always a problem. And today it is more of a problem. And I'm just afraid that, and we've already seen some decrements in the supplemental for Iraq support to both state and defense. I am concerned that when the spotlight is off this transition and it's forgotten about, and states doing their thing, and they're, you know, they've taped this thing together, and, and I'm confident it will happen. It, it'll be, it'll work but a lot can fall through the cracks. We have got to have stable funding when no longer is this the top priority after Afghanistan. And it seems to be a big crack. It is a big crack. That is yeah. right. Yeah. It is a big crack. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from um, California, the ranking member of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I am going to stay right along your line of questioning. Let me start off by <clears throat> Reminding all of us uh, on this side and informing you, uh, a while back we did a good, a good and important hearing that sort of was sad, and that was on how the Coast Guard decided it was going to create its fleet of, of blue water naval ships, if you will, and they didn't know how to do it. And the end result is we've got ships that are going to break in half sooner than they normally do, and it, you know, it's, uh, it boils down to less life because they didn't have the right designers. And they were designing a ship that was substantially similar to ones that were designed by the Navy successfully for years. That taught all of us something, which is that procurement doesn't belong just to the agency doing it. It belongs to this committee to find and ensure that if the skills exist in one part, under one stovepipe of Congress and one stovepipe of the administration, and the need is in another, we have an obligation 
to either assist or deconflict. I think we have that here today. I think we can all agree on that. Let me start by asking a question for the record, which is, does the State Department have the acquisition skills in, by any stretch of the imagination to acquire 7,000 people and commensurate hard assets to do the type of security protection and, and missions uh, in Iraq that we see for at least the next year? I would answer that, uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, Congressman Issa, that, that um, uh, they do have acquisition skill sets to award contracts. That's I, not my question, I, though. I think the contract oversight and the management of that uh, is absolutely strained to the max now. They have been providing some additional support for contract oversight uh, based on need. If you triple the force, for example, of private security contractors, the inference is clear. You are going to have to, if you want to have boots on the ground to take a look and make sure that they are complying with uh, use of force criteria, uh, you have to have the people to do the oversight. That is going to be a challenge that. Um, okay, but let us break it down a little differently. Do they, know, do they know how to buy Predator aircraft? No. To figure out which one? Not do they presently. Know, they know how to buy armored vehicles? They don't have experience. Okay. They don't know how to buy anti-mortar, anti-missile systems. They are going to have to learn how. Do they? No. They, they don't Mr. have Green, that experience. If they don't have that experience, and if 100 percent of the skills exist in the United States military, both for acquisition and among our uniformed men and women, and they have historically done a big part of the job, as distasteful as it is to say we are going to break with long tradition of having military not standing next to ambassadors as they go into heads of state and so on, aren't we just arguing over the uniform? And let me just give you a hypothetical, because it is beyond the jurisdiction of this committee, but not beyond our imaginations. If we look at our 50,000 men and women already there and we segment or ask the administration to consider segmenting this role on a secunded basis to where they would assume those additional duties as they have in the past. If we do that, don't we save money, save trying to train, and in the case of men and women in uniform who have been doing much of this job, save using private contractors who ultimately, as patriotic as they might be, are in fact more alien to the process of protecting uh, our diplomatic service than uh, the military itself is. State would be thrilled to have that support and, in fact, will need it and have asked for it. Just take, go, go back to log cap as an example. Uh, if DOD, in their wisdom, says, okay, we will support you with log cap for the next one, two, whatever years, and we will provide also that oversight and management, that mechanism that is in place today to oversee those contracts. They also would want, and you mentioned UAVs and uh, CRAM, they also will need help and will ask for help and have asked for help as they begin to develop those requirements. So, so to, to put it short, this is, a, this is a gaping hole which we are deeply concerned about and the time is ticking down to zero, and yet it is by definition a self-inflicted wound if it is not necessary to move it, but rather a decision for the military to shed something for whatever reason, when in fact the most capable, most cost effective support might in fact already exist with our military and have no justification for the long run for most of the rest of the world for our men and women in the diplomatic service. Believe me, State Department knows where their weaknesses are and has reached out and I hope will continue to reach out to the Defense Department in those areas where defense obviously has the expertise. Well, as we continue to look at it, uh, I'm going to only close with one question. I know we are talking in your specific expertise is in Iraq, but we have Iraq and Afghanistan. We also have the Horn of Africa and we have other areas around the world that are hot, can become super hot and could fit the same model. Don't we have an obligation to have an answer that isn't simply go look for recently departed from the military personnel to bring them in as contractors, but rather have an in-sourced, in-government 
uh, group of people who can, can meet those responses, which could escalate quick, as quickly, well, I shouldn't say as they de-escalate, because they don't seem to de-escalate quickly, but they do escalate quickly. Isn't that true? Uh, Mr. Congressman, we, uh, Congressman Issa, we, we would absolutely agree with that. And the fact that the United States Army now has a core capability, they have more than 200 individuals on a team uh, in Iraq right now doing log cap, for example. There are no state employees doing log cap. The only alternative is contractor or our contractor employees. Your reference to other theaters is spot on. There, there, there is an absolute need to be able to respond quickly and effectively. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I hope we have a second round. I think this is a good line of questioning, and I appreciate your time and yield back. Right. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from uh, Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Tebow. I'm going over your uh, testimony, what you have read and, and didn't read that is in your prepared statement. And I see uh, phrases like, no clear guiding policy, a pickup game, lack of transparency, visibility, and basic data, um, transition, limbo, state required to undertake a very large, hurried, expensive, and unprecedented exercise in contracting, um, functions falling off the table, Diplomatic presence reestablished and expanding in a country that appears unable to provide normal host country security and services. There is another way to caption this, fiasco. I mean, and this is not about fault. It is a fiasco. Uh, that is what you have described. Now, I think, you know, when you hear about this discussion about the Department of Defense and State, it is like we are talking about two different countries here, just within the same government. So what is what's really going on here? I think this is a teachable moment, Mr. Chairman. Let us look at the Washington Post's account yesterday, Bob, Bob Woodward's new book. Here is a quote. I want, you to th I want everyone to think about this. Woodward quotes uh, General Petraeus as saying, quote, you have to recognize also that I don't think we, uh, you win this war. I think you keep fighting. It is a little bit like Iraq, actually. He is talking about Afghanistan. But then he says, yes, there have been enormous progress in Iraq, but there are still horrific attacks in Iraq. You have to stay vigilant. You have to stay after it. This is the kind of fight we are in for the rest of our lives and probably our kids' lives." Unquote. The Washington Post, the same Washington Post article also tells of a, of a real struggle inside the administration where um, President Obama quote, kept asking for an exit plan to go along with, uh, uh, let's see, Obama kept asking for an exit plan to go along with any further troop commitment and is showing growing increasingly frustrated with the military hierarchy for not providing one. So I think what is going on here, based on what this testimony is, is that the Department of Defense isn't getting its way. They, the top military commanders, like Petraeus, want to stay in Iraq. And so it is okay with them if the State Department's mission collapses, because it opens the door for them to come in and to stay. It's so clear, this is so clear to see. And it has to, this testimony has to be put in the context of a desire of certain top military commanders to thwart, frustrate, delay, and otherwise impede an exit plan exit strategy from Iraq. I mean, this, this Woodward book is an important book that is coming out. But you have to look at the struggle that has been going on within the administration to try to end the war. There are people, they might be good soldiers, they might be fine individuals, but they should not be making the policy for the United States of America. That is up to the President of the United States. And we see this report, it is a very disturbing report in Woodward's book. And when you hear this testimony today and you put it together with this emerging view of what is going on, there is just no question that the Department of Defense will do anything it can at this point to thwart the mission of the State Department to try to achieve a peaceful transition. Very clear. That is what is really going on here. There is just, it is just so clear. I am amazed that 
Uh, you can't say it, Mr. Tebow, but you've said it in so many words or less. And I don't think that I, I have numerous questions to ask you, but after I read your report and I'm thinking about what I read yesterday, Mr. Chairman, uh, what we really ought to be doing is calling the Secretary of Defense in front of this committee and General Petraeus and get them to explain why they're not cooperating with the State Department. That's what we really need to do. You know, we, the State Department has been given a, a mission impossible given the fact that the Department of Defense is not cooperating. And we know why. They don't want to leave. Why don't they want to leave? Well, you know, that's a subject for another hearing. I don't have anything more to say. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, his statement. Uh, now I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lucamayo. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the title of the hearing today is Transition Iraq. Is the State Department prepared to take the lead? And in your summary, uh, Mr. Thibault, you uh, indicate that, uh, well, you list a, a list of concerns here. Uh, unknown contract and program support from the DOD, funding limitations likely to impact mission capability, the need to contract for and perform functions that have never been done by their department, uh, and feel the department has been placed in for a position to be able to deliver on their mission. I guess my question is, you sort of prefaced in your summary here the reason for failure of the State Department to be able to lead and or its, uh, its concerns about leading. And I wish you would elaborate on that because I would like to know, is the State Department prepared to lead in this? Um, our assessment, my assessment, is they are prepared to lead if they must. Their preference is to do as has been discussed here earlier, which is those organizations that can best provide support would provide them the support. That's the request. And the request has, the point is, is the request has been out there almost six months. And so they're going with a dual approach of planning, which doesn't make a lot of sense to us, which is their approach is if the Department of Defense gives us support, here's what we can do. But if they don't give us support, and they've begun solicitation planning to use contractors for the many items introduced in our statement and in our prior report, simply because they may not have a choice. And the points that have been made here, uh, what, what we're trying to force out is a decision, and then a debate on that decision, and the decision just is not forthcoming. Okay, so we're, we, you, you've delineated the, the concerns and the problems, um, and obviously there's some give and take here on what's going on. Just let me, let me back up a little bit to a couple of things that during your testimony you raised some questions. Um, um, one of the things you talked about was the MRAPs are going to be allowed to be used by the contractors. How much other equipment are we going to be leaving behind? or reassigning to the contractors or taking, uh, do we give up ownership of this as, as, uh, as United States or is it going to be ours and going to be utilized by the contractors? How does that work? Right. This would be gov still government owned equipment. The State Department okay. provided a page long, very detailed request for various equipment items to include MRAPs and aviation transport and other types of critical equipment. That is also part of the request that is out there. That uh, hasn't been forthcoming, but the government would own it. But I think the uh, example of Commissioner Green, MRAPs go where there's security issues. Right. Uh, everyone here knows that there's a, a gunner on top of an MRAP, and the gunner's job is to provide safety. And we could say it's defensive, but it's really offensive. It's to take down insurgents. That's the great example of, of government-owned equipment that's going to be operated by contractors, unless. Uh, this coordination process evolves into something uh, more meaningful. What do, you, what do you believe the mission to be for the uh, transition here over to the State Department? Do you believe it to be a, a military operation yet, or is it, is it turned completely into a uh, political operation, or is it a combination of both? Well, I, I would say their mission that they would see is a diplomatic mission in an environment that is absolutely not secure. So by default, if they are providing all services, it has to be a combination of both. Okay. Well, during your testimony, you also made a comment, something about uh, the military was unable to respond to an attack under the new guidelines here. Is that, did I misunderstand No, that? sir. Okay. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? 
um, I'm, 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 I'm drawing a blank on, on the military unable. Oh, I, what I would elaborate on in, in, in my testimony was that now, within six to eight seconds, the military puts indirect fire on top of insurgents who mount rockets or mortars and the like. Um, the State Department has said, well, we would have difficulty obtaining that service from contractors, uh, and therefore we don't have any plans to replace it. The difficulty becomes is if you're one of the bad guys and there's no one raining fire down on your head immediately, you're liable to, rather than take one rocket and run, which is bad enough, you're liable to take many rockets and fire them all off into the area. And rockets are very random, and the potential for security uh, risks are, are amplified. The, the contractors don't have the ability to respond? The contractors don't run indirect fire mortars. They, they, there's no experience in the... Uh, okay, so our mission there then is it, is it, is it trans transitions over to the, the State Department would be less military then? Uh, it would have to be the use of contractors if the military was not available to do counter battery. Uh, the only other option would be the Iraqi forces uh, providing that support, but to date that's not considered an option. Okay, I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Congressman Turney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen. Uh, when I wrote this bill that formed your wartime contracting commission in the House with my colleague Jim Leach, Republican, uh, and then Jim uh, Webb took it up in the Senate, it was our intention to uh, give you the authority to go in and look at just these types of matters. And I want to thank you for doing that. I wish we had gotten the bill, it was a bipartisan bill, through the House earlier, so you could have got an earlier start. But the important aspect of that was, in fact, identifying exactly what is an inherently governmental function, uh, and then giving us a course of, of how to remedy the current situation. Uh, so I'm assuming that your report, either an interim report or a final report, is going to give us a path of a recommendation as to what are the inherently governmental functions, how we ought to get to the point where government does them, uh, and then if the correct government agency can't do it immediately, uh, then how we are going to arrange for a proper government agency to do it in the interim and then have a path of training uh, people and bringing people on board for the right government agency to eventually do those functions. Uh, and in the interim, if perchance some of it has to be done by contractors, and, and hopefully not, uh, how they are going to get the right management and oversight personnel and the right number of them in place uh, to carry out those activities with insight not just into the subcontract but the sub-subcontracts. That kind of insight has been terribly missing, like our subcommittee on national security and foreign affairs cited in the Warlord Inc. report for just one example on that. Am I right about this expectation for your report? You are you're absolutely correct, Congressman. Okay. Uh, then, I, you know, then I think we have here a real, a real issue about funding on that. Uh, and the State has been hollowed out. I think you point that out very well on that. And we have had a number of hearings on our subcommittee as well. Now, Secretary Gates has indicated in the past that he thinks he is going to save about $100 billion uh, in his cuts in the Department of Defense on things that are redundant or uh, ought not to be continued on. The problem, as I see it, is he has made some rhetoric in the past about thinking that the State Department ought to be beefed up. Uh, I would hope that your recommendations go as to how some of those savings for our national security interests would be transferred into the Secretary of State's uh, agency to allow us to have a better national security posture by beefing up the Secretary of State. I don't know if you are going to go there or not, but I would recommend that you take a look at that. It is all under the national security umbrella. It is not just a, you know, a situation we have to stay in silos anymore. Uh, and if we are going to have a good national security posture, then it has to be one that puts the right people out front in the right places and it all has to be seen as national security. It doesn't, really shouldn't matter where the money comes from on that. And I think, you can correct me if I am wrong, that this is something we can look at not just in Afghanistan and Af in Iraq, but in all of the places where Mr. Uh, Issa indicated that we may be posturing in the future, whether it be Yemen, Somalia, Sudan or whatever, is to look at the right mix of people, what is inherently governmental there, and how we get those personnel in place. Are you going to have time to do all of that uh, by the time your report needs to be issued? Well, you know, we're, we're challenged, and we're putting out a report this December with our legislative proposals so that they can be considered, or very early January, so they can be considered uh, by the Congress. Uh, in, in answer to your, 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 your point, which is, which is accurate, if the State, and, and Commissioner Green may, may want to amplify, if the State Department doesn't receive the kinds of funds that they're not receiving now, 
no matter what their capability is, they're not going to get the job done because they're not going to have the staff, the people, the resources to award and oversee contracts. Uh, if part of that mechanism is to utilize funds that have been saved in defense or have defense provide certain functions that they already do, um, that, that will greatly contribute to the State's objectives. Yeah, I, I think that is basically accounting, right? If, 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 in fact, you take the money that's saved in the Department of Defense and it goes to Secretary of State and temporarily they can't do it themselves, they are just subcontracting back to the Department of Defense. You know, and maybe they have to work some arrangement uh, on a memorandum of agreement or something where the resources are at least put in the right place right. and then temporarily spent back on that basis to cover it. Because I know there's a lot of maneuvering between the secretaries here, who's going to pay for what, it's, uh, what budget this comes out of. But the fact of the matter is we've somehow, Mr. Chairman, got to transcend that and say, look, if you're going to save X amount of dollars and it ought to be in the Secretary of State's division and it temporarily DOD has to fulfill it, then let them do some contract or something on that basis but at least set up the mechanism where we are transitioning on a long-range plan. We have a plan to get where we eventually need to be, because we cannot have the number of contractors, private contractors out there doing inherently governmental functions because it is not the right message to send, because there is no uh, check on liability, there is no accountability, uh, and frankly, it is riff uh, for you know, fraud and abuse uh, and overspending and inefficiency. So it is a big challenge that you have. It is one that we put in the legislation for you to do. I thank you for, for thank starting you. off on that way, and we will support you any way we can, I suspect. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank the gentleman from Massachusetts and also to thank him for his work in this area. And, uh, of course, um, uh, we still have a long way to go, but I want to let him know he has really got us going. And uh, I think the, 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 the serious questions are being raised. That is the reason why I think this hearing is just so important. I now yield to the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Congressman Connolly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let, if I may, uh, and, and welcome, gentlemen, let me, let me pick up on where Mr. Tierney uh, just left off. Uh, you know, I, I find that uh, sometimes the definition of inherently governmental is deceptively simple. Uh, let me ask you both. Uh, for example, is the provision of security, ongoing security, for U.S. personnel in Iraq an inherently governmental function in your view? Well, the simple, simple answer, and, and I do not mean to be vague, is, is our perspective, and we, we have not come down formally on this because it is that important, uh, is to recognize the different types of security. Because you have convoy security, you have distinguished visitor security, and you have static or base security. Um, there, there haven't been substantial issues or country concerns about base security. Uh, there have been issues about uh, convoy security, very significant issues about the use of uh, private security contractors and the like. Um, uh, well, uh, your answer certainly comports with my own view that, again, I repeat, deceptively simple. The answer is it depends. There are some security correct. functions that it may be perfectly proper for the government to take over. There may be others we want to continue to contract out for various and sundry reasons. It depends. That is accurate. Mr. Green, you would concur? Uh, I would concur. Um, I think the difficulty here, and we haven't talked much about this, is we are really in a box. Uh, we have got December 2011 uh, to get all troops out of country, um, and there really is no alternative, if that is the way we are going, there is no alternative to contractors whether they are doing inherently governmental things or they are running a mess hall. Um, and, you know, until when and if that uh, decision is modified, um, we are going to do it with contractors. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me ask a broader, uh, well, just on contracting, one estimate of the number of security folks we are going to need, uh, the State Department is going to need in taking over new responsibilities is they probably need somewhere in the vicinity of six or 7,000 contractors. Correct. Correct. You would agree with that number? Yes. yes, sir. And how are they coming along in securing contracts to secure six to 7,000 private contractors for security? I, um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think I can assist with that. They, they have several solicitations that are in the works because of the growth. And the solicitations generally go towards existent companies that, with a proven record, contractors, 
because they have confidence in working with them, and in a very short turnaround, you tend to go with those organizations. They try to utilize competition, but it's not as broad a base as might be desirable simply because of the expedient nature of the mission. Are we confident that there'll be a, that there won't be any holes in the security apparatus because of contracting mechanisms or or delays in the signing of contracts and the execution thereof? Well, the execution is interesting because the way they're aligning is is right now, you know, there there remains using Iraq, it could fit Afghanistan, I guess, but there are there are about 50 military bases, forward bases, and military bases that'll go to maybe 14 or 15 counting those that are, are, are there for the Department of Defense for foreign military sales. Uh, by necessity, what they have done is cut back their diplomatic capability to travel throughout the country. So one of the implications and, and outcomes. They being our State Department. State Department is yeah. they will not do the diplomatic mission to the extent they would like to, because they, they even with 7,000, they have cut back dramatically, for example, in the number of what they call uh, PRTs or the provincial teams that uh, build diplomacy and, and, and build a, a relationships and, and provide assistance. Uh, uh, that has been totally pulled back to their four existing bases because of security. And that is with 7,000 additional security individuals. If they tried to keep it the way that they would had it, uh, I have no idea what that number would be, but it would be substantially more, maybe double. At, at least speaking for this member, Mr. Tebow, what you just said is stunning. Um, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. I now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I suppose this is as good a time as any and a good issue and location as any to a say that I have a hard time disagreeing with my colleague, the gentleman from Ohio, about this issue. Um, it is extraordinarily frustrating, and we should care about the issue wherever it is in the United States, the fundamental issue of, of that which makes our country safer. And the fact is this transition has to work, and the Department of Defense has to help, um, because we are forgetting the issue closer to home here. And if I might indulge, we have heard of threats everywhere and would-be bombers. Well, the most recent one was in Chicago, and the would-be bomber placed the bomb a block from my house. So I can't help notice that the work that really matters, uh, first and foremost, is taking place right here in this country. And uh, the success that has taken place in stopping this uh, is good police work right here in this country. So you will have to forgive me if I am frustrated that the Department of Defense uh, seems to have the mindset that staying in, Ara in Iraq for a lifetime is going to somehow make us safer. Uh, this has to work. The current strategy uh, of stalling and making this difficult is counterproductive and in the long run makes us less safe. To the extent you gentlemen are willing to, to chime in, in the end, even if this transition works to the extent that you are talking about, do you really think the dynamics inside Iraq are going to be different five years from now or ten years from now so that someone else from the outside won't have to play a big role? Uh, that is <clears throat> certainly a question that uh, intellectually I am sure all of us have thought about. It's, it is not within our charter, certainly. One of the great frustrations uh, that State uh, feels and Defense feels, the, the Chairman has uh, remarked uh, to it, uh, as well as uh, Secretary Gates and, and folks within the State Department, is the unsettled nature of the Iraqi government. There are many, many decisions that uh, cannot be made until there is a government. Um, I can speculate uh, till the cows come home when that might happen and the difficulties in achieving that. But uh, the fact remains, uh, until that government is settled, there are many, many decisions um, that cannot be uh, made between State and the Defense Department. And 
I don't want to leave the impression that defense is being uncooperative. Uh, we talked the one issue, the, the, the log cap memo, I'll call it. Uh, we, that, that we don't understand why that has taken so long. But in other areas, there has been significant cooperation. And in fact, I briefed General Austin uh, about three days before he left here to take over command in Iraq. And I told him, I said, you know, if this fails, it's not state failing, it's the country failing. And that's what it is. So we've got to work together, uh, state, defense, and any other USAID, any other departments and agencies that have a stake in this have got to lean forward in the foxhole and make sure it happens uh, the way our country is set up uh, for it to happen. And, and I might add that uh, as part of your question, uh, I, uh, I think it uh, is reflective today of the environment related to security as we pull out, which is in some cases increased uh, given the fact that we are at fewer locations. Uh, there is no indication that that is going to cease when we turn simply to a diplomatic approach in 2011. We would all like that. I mean, I think everyone would like that. But uh, there is no indication. Therefore, the State Department, as a good steward of safety, contracting, and the like, uh, if, if you look at the numbers now on their four permanent locations they are building out right now, and they are building it out, somewhere between two-thirds and 75 percent of each one of those locations are security people. And the number of diplomats, and two of them, because they had to cut them in half because of budgets, you can't cut the security, are 20. So you have at, 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 at embassy branch offices or consulates 20 people doing what State Department would like to do, and several hundred individuals doing security. And, and that is, I think, reflective of your concern. I agree. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, now recognize the um, gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Speer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for your service. I am somewhat dumbfounded by what you have presented to us today. In, in some respects, we are just re rearranging deck chairs, it would appear, and substituting a group of contractors to do what our military has been doing and the contractors will be overseen by a State Department that doesn't have the oversight authority or capacity to do the job. Is that a fair analysis? Well, I think the State Department would say they are working very hard to try to build that capability, but I think that would be a concern that they have that because historically they have been, to call it just like it is, they have been slow to provide the kinds of contract oversight. They have been very responsive but it has been a, a, a situation where their staff limitations have created challenges. And uh, to pry out four or five additional contracting officer representatives to do the kind of work they do, which is to make sure a security company is, is satisfying their contract requirements, uh, ha has been a challenge. So it will continue to be a challenge. Has the State Department ever had similar responsibilities in any other country? No, not, not like this. Uh, I mentioned early on uh, that, that I participated in the transition from uh, uh, the Coalition Provisional Authority to the, the new embassy in 2004. Um, and obviously, uh, when the Soviet Union went down and the State Department created a number of new embassies, uh, those were big jobs, but they have never, I, in my estimation, and I think others would support this, they have never faced this kind of a task in such a hostile or I'll say non-benign environment. Um, so you're you're in a threat, a high threat area, and that's something we don't know what's going to happen in December of 2011 with the insurgency. Uh, what, what are they going to do? We have already seen uh, periodic upticks in threats. In fact, the embassy compound uh, 
took some rockets not long ago, and I was told that one of them uh, clipped the DCM's residence. Uh, so it, it is a high threat environment complicated by the fact that they are going to have to take over many, many, many missions which they have no experience doing. No core competency. With, That's not their job. Well, it's not their job. Not no. Their no. No. So the we're, kind giving, of, we're giving the State Department a job which they don't have core competency in, that they don't have the experience or expertise, and we're telling them to, to go out and do this. And by the way, um, you are going to have six or 7,000 contractors mm -hmm. under the auspices of the United States mm -hmm. operating in country. Well, and, they, and you, have to, you have to add to that, because we are talking security contractors. If they are left holding the uh, logistical support bag, they are going to have a, you know, they, they, they do not have a present capability in theater. They have no experience. They have relied on the Army. Um, right now, because I, in advance of this, I, I pulled down the number, there are 36,300 um, KBR employees that are providing logistical support. I, excuse in me Iraq. one moment. Let me interrupt you, uh, and I apologize. That is a sole source contract to KB. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there, no competitive bidding. Exactly. But there are 36,300. That number will come down from 50 bases to maybe 14 locations. But if you do the math, 30 percent times 40,000, uh, I could come up with another 10,000 that they would have to manage if, in fact, the Army doesn't provide that support. And the Army has become, at, from a management perspective, not necessarily a contracting, but from a management perspective, they are much better than they were. But to take it away from them and, and have the State Department start all over, just doesn't make sense. No. And in fairness, in fairness, I'm sorry, my time yeah. is about up. Let me just add, okay. ask one more question: Is this going to cost the taxpayers of this country more money? Absolutely. How much more money? Uh, it's really indeterminable, but uh, very substantial amounts of money, because there's going to have to be some kind of a transition, and a transition, especially if competition results in a different contractor, you might save some money in competition but you are going to be introducing the need for the transition. To, you know, our, our position is that starting in 2011, they should use Log Cap 4. They should award a solicitation, bring competition in. If KBR wins it, great. If uh, DynCorp or Floor wins it, great. But there is a mechanism. But the longer we draw this out, just like the continuation of Log Cap 3, the longer you draw it out, the more likely it's you're going to get a letter from the Department of Defense or from State saying we don't have time to use competition. Let's extend this sole source contract. That's the risk. And we better get this right because we're going to be doing it in Afghanistan in not too the too distant future. Right. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. And now you have five minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, Congressman McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And at this time I'd like to yield the balance of my time to the ranking member, Mr. Eisen. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I want to follow up on something because I think it, 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 it wasn't intended, I'm sure, to be part of this hearing, but it now is. The gentleman from Ohio, I believe, implied that he needed to get uh, General Petraeus and the Secretary of Defense in here, if I understood correctly, because you know the military doesn't want to leave and they want the State Department to fail. Mr. Green, you have been on both sides of this. Do you see any malice or any legitimacy to uh, uh, the, th the thought that either DOD or State wants the other to fail? No, I, I do not. Um, and I, you know, somebody maybe can find it, but I see no evidence that the military wants to stay in Iraq. Um, I just, you know, I serve two tours in Vietnam, and I was happy to leave. There is uh, a reason you count down those days. <laughs> that is right. But uh, I, I think that there, there is cooperation. Why log cap, why this one request has been held up, I, I don't think we need to build everything, the whole relationship around <clears throat> whether that one request was held up or not. Yes, it is a major one. But there has been a lot of other cooperation at the working level between state and the, the uh, commands, and certainly in country. So yeah. no, I'm, I'm sure simple answer is no. Yeah. 
And you'd say no also, I'm sure. I, I would say no also. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I agree with that statement. Uh, there is no indication at all that uh, the United States Army uh, w wants to remain. In fact, they're pulling troops out, um, you know, in, in a manner in which, which we might say pause in terms of some of this support requirement that the State Department needs. But in my mind, and maybe others' minds, I think there's a question about uh, does the Army really want to provide the kind of support that State needs? And that, I think, is the, the stovepipe situation that you've already talked about. Well, and, and the gentleman from Massachusetts alluded to the, the question that some of this seems to be funding fight and, and the question of nobody wanting to spend their resources unless they're fully funded and so on. And let me just put it in a, a context that, you know, we, we've all been to other host countries, and I'll just use Japan as a good example. In Japan, we have a large military presence, and that large military presence, they're not just our host, but they're our financial host. And so when we view our military support there, we view it as fully funded by the host country. In the case of Iraq, should this committee look into, and Afghanistan, because you are absolutely right, we are going down that road, that the funding should be, even if it is U.S. dollars, should be hosted there. So regardless of who goes there, they must go there to get the money. In other words, if the Army were looking at cycling through people or the Air Force or anybody else or State, the money is there, they tap that money in host country. If they don't provide the support, if it goes to a contractor or it goes to a State Department employee, they use those funds. Would that movement of dollars to be independent of who does it allow for all the agencies to maybe play better in the sandbox? If, if, if such a thing was uh, remotely possible that they could fund it, I know in Afghanistan, if you look at the monies we are spending now, the country has no ability to fund it. Oh, and I am not suggesting for a moment that we expect that the money would come from the host country. Right. But when it comes from the host country, uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force, everybody sort of competes for, okay, can I get a slot in there? Is that slot meaningful? And I know I am going to be paid for it. If we move it to, because we're, look, we, we have an appropriation system. It is stovepiped for the most part by committees. But if we looked at Iraq and we had Iraq funding as a standalone and we made it independent of whether the Army or the State Department or the Department of Interior got the money initially, but the money was there and we did an authorization for that. Now, it is basically still State Department money, but it wouldn't be State Department money in, a, in the large barrel. It would be Iraq funding for State activities. If we did that, wouldn't that eliminate some of this problem of people being reticent to pay for something unless they are going to get paid back because they see it as taking from other mission? Uh, I think uh, if I understand your, your uh, premise, um, I think something like that was recommended by Secretary Gates to Secretary Clinton. Um, and as I understand the proposal, and I don't understand it terribly well, that each would put money in a pot uh, commensurate with their responsibilities to do certain things. Um, as you know uh, better than I, a state's budget is minuscule compared to DOD. DOD rounds off more at the end of the year than state has to spend other than in foreign assistance, uh, which can't be touched for this. Uh, I, and I haven't given it a lot of thought, but if there were an appropriation, a pot of money, uh, and, the, and the State Department didn't have to contribute to that, because that's where I think they have a, a, a difficulty. But if there were a pot of money, uh, I think it would eliminate some of this back and forth because, as as someone mentioned before, you know Gates is going to save a hundred million bucks, but he's going to let the services keep that to apply it to new weapon systems and personnel increases. So unless somebody says no, he can't do that, 
uh, that is what his plan is. The gentleman from North Carolina's time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I, I would ask that the, uh, the witnesses expand on that in writing and that perhaps we, we flesh out some of the possibilities together to recommend to the President. Without objection. Thank you. So ordered. I now recognize the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Watson. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am sitting here very, very frustrated because we got into a war that was not declared by Congress. The Secretary of State said, if you break it, you own it. And there is no way, and I want this for the record, there is no way that we are going to win a war of a particular uh, cultural and traditional uh, quality with guns and bullets. Now we are discussing the State Department whose mission is completely different. The mission of the State Department is to work on the foreign policy of our government and the post we are in, the nation we are in, diplomatically. So I think the responsibility, and I am saying this is a commission to deliver uh, to your members and to the President, uh, we need to have the military and this committee needs to do the oversight, provide for the military security and the security of our missions as long as we are there. We have not won a war. We are trying to have a sovereign nation use a diplomatic system with their experimenting with, but we do not need to take on that burden uh, through the State Department. So what I am asking is, will you recommend strongly again in your next report that the military take over uh, securing with the number of forces that are needed as long as we are there. And my friend, we are going to be there forever. It is a completely different part of the world with different goals and different ways of running their own nations. We have to understand that. And so my question to you is, can we put forth a contingency plan for the State Department to be able to have the kind of security and to fulfill their mission that will be funded through the resources of DOD? Under the current budgetary and fiscal guidelines, you know, you are asking, can we? That is not doable because there's What is not doable? Separate streams of funds and the like. Uh, this committee or an organization. Well, what are we asking the State Department to do? We are asking the State Department to take over the responsibilities of the military. Correct? Uh, in many cases, that is absolutely yeah, correct. I ran a mission. It was a tiny mission over in Micronesia. We contracted out our security. We hired a former Marine who headed up a security company. And because of the size of the mission, it worked. But we are in a war zone as determined by the last administration, and we still have troops there. So can we, using that kind of line of thinking, ask the Department of Defense to increase the budget for securing that mission that we are still involved in? We, we would support, and, and it is it's stated in, in our testimony, a requirement that the Department of Defense more timely and effectively sit with the State Department, go through those functions that they ought to be doing, exactly. and that there be a requirement that they do those functions. Uh, from a budgetary viewpoint, uh, the question then remaining is, is who funds it? Okay, let me take that off the table and ask uh, the chairman of this committee if we can develop a letter uh, stating just what has been mentioned and uh, send it to the president, commander-in-chief, and to DOD and to the State Department 
because the State Department does not have the skill sets to provide the kind of security. They contract it out, usually. So the subject matter of this whole hearing is the oversight responsibility that we have. And I think we ought to send a letter saying, let DOD do what it's uh, assigned to do so the State Department can carry out its mission and provide the funding. I understand the lady's uh, request, what we do here from the second panel, and make a decision as to how we move from Thank here. You. Thank you. The gentlewoman's time has expired. And I recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Congressman Duncans, for five minutes. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I was in other meetings, uh, I wasn't able to get here in time, and so I'm going to yield my, my question, questioning period to uh, uh, Mr. Issa. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman from Tennessee. And I, uh, I believe this is so important. Our staff has worked hard on, on more questions than we will ever ask. And I would ask if both of the gentlemen would be willing to answer some additional ones in writing. Absolutely. Uh, Certainly. We'll, they will probably be the ones less of interest uh, to some people, but more of interest to the staff that in detail would like to produce a, a report afterwards. I am uh, I'm on leave of absence from the Foreign Affairs Committee. So I have to know my limitations and I have to remember the jurisdiction of that committee. But we have 1,600 people in six major facilities in Iraq in the current plan, roughly. Is that right? That is the number that I have got in front of me for the embassy and branches or consulates. The it, diplomatic side? Diplomatic side, yes. That is prob probably, probably pretty close. Yes. So part of the need for uh, a total of 7,700 people or roughly 6,100 contractors if the fit doesn't hit the shan in the weeks after military begins pulling out mm -hmm. is because of the size of our mission, the largest mission anywhere in the world. Is that right? It is both uh, the static security of the embassy and the four other posts plus the personal security details that would be there and available to escort and protect uh, the uh, diplomatic uh, staff. Now, in my time uh, going around the world in the Foreign, Sur Foreign Affairs Committee, one of the things that I observed regularly was that USAID typically only goes if it is safe enough, and in the Horn of Africa, in a number of other areas, it usually begins phasing over to the military to do aid projects if it is an unsecure situation. Iraq has fit that, Afghanistan fits that. This is a place in which the military contributes far more to the construction projects and so on than the State Department. Am I to understand that this plan envisions USAID taking over construction and activities of that sort, development and the democracy movement, and doing so with this size force as it does not do in most other areas? Yeah. I think that certainly the AID mission, uh, when it comes to reconstruction and stability operations, uh, will increase because to the degree that uh, we would do SERP-like projects, right. uh, they won't be SERP, but AID would take over those to the degree they have the capability and that they are implementing partners have the capability. Uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, the, the, the AID staff, if, it's, uh, if there are unsecured areas, they don't tend to go out, but they count on their implementing partners. And, and very frankly, uh, most of the implementing partners don't want that linkage with the Defense Department. They don't want a flag out there because they believe it attracts the wrong kind of attention. Sure, I understand that, and uh, that's always controversial. Who signs goes goes up, and who gets credit? Yep. And uh, there's always some sheikh who would prefer the credit over <laughs> over anybody else. Uh, actually, I remember in the later latter days of uh, of Jimmy Carter, when we sent free wheat to Russia to Soviet Union, and they proceeded to paint over anything that said U.S. and put "Good Made in Russia" uh, on it, so that their people would think they were being fed by themselves. Uh, I guess things never change. The, uh, the question I have it goes back to that self-inflicted wound. We have missions of various size, Marines and seconded uh, military personnel, military attaches. Egypt, for example, has a large 
amount of our military people that are work in and, and for the ambassador. Is there any inherent reason that Iraq is preventing military assets from being, I use the word seconded, but assigned to the ambassador for purposes of many of these duties? Is there anything that has absolutely been negotiated away so that would be impossible? No, not that I am aware of. In fact, uh, plans